We are here today to discuss our vision for America's economic revival. We want lower taxes, bigger paychecks, and more jobs for American truckers and for American workers. Network news has become so partisan, distorted, and fake that licenses must be challenged and, if appropriate, revoked. Not fair to public. If it's an anti-Trump story, there's no vetting required. They'll just run with it. The Boy Scouts are not the Boy Scouts anymore, apparently. It's the tyranny of political correctness. It's, it's another reason why Trump won. I think people are tired of this. And good morning to you. You are watching Fox and Friends first on this Thursday morning, very early, 4 a.m. here on the East Coast. And we certainly appreciate you waking up and joining us, or if you're just getting home, joining us as well. We want to go right to our top story for you right now. Though President Trump is set to take a major step in fulfilling another campaign promise today after taking his tax plan on the road. Griff Jenkins joins us now live from Washington, D.C. with some more. Good morning, Griff. Good morning, Heather. Calling truckers America's heroes, President Trump did take that tax plan on the road, saying that this plan puts more money in the pockets of working families and is fair to the middle class. He hailed a growing economy and gains on Wall Street, but says to truly get America back on the right track, we have to transform an outdated and burdensome tax code. Under our framework, we make the zero bracket bigger, and get rid of the 10% bracket, and we're reducing the 15% rate down to 12%. Now, it's early, but bear with me. The plan would reduce the existing seven brackets, or eight if you include the zero bracket, as he does, down to a simple four. They would be 0%, 12%, 25%, and 33%. The key is the expansion of the 0% bracket to include a lot of those who would have traditionally fallen into the bottom two brackets under this complicated current system. In addition, the plan doubles the standard deduction for individuals and families, and it cuts that corporate rate from 35% to 20%. President Trump called for bipartisan support for this plan, but Democrats pan the speech as nothing more than a massive tax cut for the wealthy and big corporations. House Minority Leader Nancy Pelosi issuing this statement saying, quote, we need real bipartisan tax reform that puts the middle class first, and that means not one penny in tax giveaways for the wealthiest 1%. The goal, of course, will be getting all Republicans on board the conservative uh, House Freedom Caucus initially says they're with it. Uh, and a little later this morning, we expect to hear a major speech from Speaker Paul Ryan talking about this very plan with a live audience. So we'll be staying tuned. Stay tuned. <laughs> All right. And stay tuned right here because we will talk with the owner of a small business on how it impacts him coming up a little bit later. Thank you so much, Griff. Appreciate it. Well, President Trump, meantime, is, is hoping, as Griff just said, for Democratic support of his tax plan with the goal of getting it passed by the end of the year. In an exclusive interview with our very own Sean Hannity, he explains why this plan gives Americans the tax cuts that they have been promised for years. When we first introduced it, and for years they talk about tax reform, I said the problem with the word reform, nobody understands what it means. Because reform could mean you're going to raise taxes. This is the largest tax cut in the history of our country. It is incredible. It's going to put people to work. So right now, Sean, we are the highest taxed nation in the world. And we're going to be now down in the lower rung in terms of taxes. Uh, a family can get and a business can get, especially a subchapter S. You know, you're doing different kinds of things with your businesses. Some people run it individually. But you can get as much as a 40 percent tax reduction. Again, it's the largest tax reduction. Well, taking his pitch to the people may actually be the key, but Fox News senior political analyst Britt Hume says that it's going to be an uphill battle with those Democrats. He is doing now on this measure what he really never did on Obamacare repeal. That is yeah. to say, he's getting out, he's talking about specifics within it, he's making an earnest effort to sell it to people. And it's not that easy with tax, tax cuts to do that. The problem politically always, Martha, with when you're cutting tax rates is that it's a mathematical fact that the more you pay, the more you gain from a tax cut. That's just the way it works. We, we live in a country where, what, some 70% 
of the taxes are paid by about 10 percent of the people. So you begin to cut the rates, the 10 percent are bound to benefit. This is the, opens the avenue for the perennial Democratic criticism that it's a tax cut for the rich. He's going to have to fight that the whole way. Well, let's talk about one of those rich folks. Now to the Harvey Weinstein scandal. TMZ reporting that Harvey boarded a private jet overnight, and he's heading to a sex rehab and behavior center in Arizona. He was originally supposed to head out of the country, but that plan changed, apparently. This latest development coming just hours after TMZ also reported that Weinstein's daughter called 911, claiming that her dad was suicidal and depressed. And now the Justice Department ordering the FBI to investigate the laundry list of sexual assault allegations. That is according to the Daily Mail. As for Hillary Clinton, it has been six days, and she has finally said that she will give Weinstein's campaign donation back, sort of. Would you give the money back? Well, there's no one to give it back to. What other people are saying, what my former colleagues are saying is they're going to donate it to charity. And of course I will do that. I give 10% of my income to charity every year. This will be part of that. Uh, there's, no, uh, there's no doubt about it. Well, Weinstein and his family have given more than $1.4 million in political contributions to the Democratic Party. And then in this strange turn of events, New York Post, or uh, page six, reporting that Harvey's wife is leaning on friend, yes, you see there, Uma Abedin. She's apparently a close Clinton aide, we, we knew that, uh, whose husband, Anthony Weiner, was just sentenced to 21 months in prison for sexting a teenager, but apparently they are friends. Well, in the wake of the Weinstein scandal, many are now saying that the party that champions women's rights has an obvious double standard when it comes to sexism. Columnist and Fox News contributor Mark Stein says that it's time to call out the left. I think it's actually worse than that, because if you notice the things that the, the, the left gets annoyed, uh, so if, if Mitt Romney, who is nobody's idea of a sex fiend, uh, and he happens to say that uh, as in encouraging women to apply for a job, he phrases it rather clumsily, and he says, binders full of women. All these uh, late night talk show hosts, everyone, he's a punchline for two weeks afterwards. Dear old decent Mitt, because he's a stiff who, who stands up when a woman enters the room and holds the door for her as she, uh, as she leaves. Meanwhile, uh, they're completely heartless about the huge mountain of human debris piled up by this Hollywood pig over the last three decades. Wow, tell us what you really think. <laughs> now let's talk about the Boy Scouts. So the Boy Scouts of America will now allow girls to join its ranks. Is it as relevant for little girls as it is little boys? And educators and our parents have said it absolutely is. So we provide a pathway so that girls can now participate fully in Cub Scouting. Well, Jackie Banez joins us now with a story that has got everyone talking this morning. So a lot of responses to this. Yes. Good morning, yeah, good Heather. Morning. All right. So this is a tradition of the Boy Scouts. It's been on the books for a century now. Mm -hmm. And things are starting to change starting next yeah. year. The move shaking up the tradition that uh, has been here forever. The Boy Scouts of America announcing girls will be allowed to become Cub Scouts starting next year. That will allow them to eventually obtain the coveted Eagle Scout rank. And a program for older girls is expected to be available in 2019, also giving them a path to become an Eagle Scout. The Boy Scouts say and it's important change, but... That change, well, it's igniting some serious backlash this morning, with some calling it unnecessary PC. As an Eagle Scout, I'm disgusted and I'm disappointed. They hate patriotism. What the left is trying to accomplish is a deconstruction of traditional values. It's the tyranny of political correctness. It's, it's another reason why Trump won. I think people are tired of this. Boys should be able to have a boys club. Girls should be able to have a girls club. Well, Donald Trump Jr. also weighing in on Twitter, writing this. Strange, I thought that's what the Girl Scouts was for. So what about the Girl Scouts now? Well, the organization blasting the decision, saying it's all about declining numbers and revenue. On social media right now, a lot of mixed reaction we're getting for you. Isaiah posting on Twitter, as a former hashtag Eagle Scout and longtime supporter of hashtag Boy Scouts, I have had enough of uh, caving to PC. I told them to take, off, take me off their list. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, right, Heather? And there's a lot going on on Facebook as well. One saying, I really do get the equality between boys and girls. But seriously, why can't boys have a boys club if Girl Scouts aren't rigorous enough, uh, then you know what, 
for these mm -hmm. adventurous things. We all kind of have our own Boy Scout, Girl Scout, right. our own little well, that, clubs. Well, that's a good question, though. What becomes of the Girl Scouts, and will the Boy Scouts still right. be called the Boy Scouts? Well, the Girl what? Scouts, uh, the leaders are not too happy about this one, right. saying that they need to yeah. have their own clubs. There's a reason for this. We want to know what everyone mm -hmm. on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram has to say about this, Heather. People yep. are fired up for sure. Yeah, so have the PC police gone too far? Uh, let Jackie know, of course, what you think about this. She'll be on Facebook Live, Twitter, or you can send us an email, and we're going to share a little bit of that later in the show, right? Yeah, I'll be we'll right back. check in with you throughout the morning. Thanks, Heather. Thank you, as always. Well, the time now is about 10 minutes after the top of the hour, and he's an illegal immigrant. He's accused of beheading his own mother. And now he might walk free. What? We'll tell you about that. Plus, one college just banned Christians from the freshman fair. Wait until you hear why. Sadly, the Democrats have become obstructionists. They want to stop. They don't want to do anything productive. They want to raise your taxes very, very substantially. While uh, the Democrats rip the president's tax plan, our next guest says that it is music to his ears, and he would know he's a small business owner and was at that rally last night. We'll talk to him and hear what he has to say about it. Welcome back. You're watching Fox and Friends First. Uh, the Las Vegas Police Department is now defending its investigation into the country music concert massacre. Uh, Sheriff Joseph Lombardo telling local media that the timeline of events, that it could change again. The department responding to criticism after police revealed that a Mandalay Bay security guard was shot before Stephen Paddock opened fire on concert goers, not after, which was what they thought initially, and they told us. Now some brand new audio emerging of calls for help from inside that hotel. Tell, listen. Call the police. Someone's firing a gun up here. Someone's firing a rifle on the 32nd floor down the hallway. Well, an autopsy of Paddock's brain showed nothing abnormal, but he may have been on an anti anxiety medication that is known to cause aggressive behavior. So the search for the motive continues. Well, a student accused of murdering a campus police officer may have used a stolen gun. A federal grand jury indicting Texas Tech student Hollis Daniels for murdering and possession of a stolen firearm. Uh, police say that Daniels pulled out a gun and then he shot this officer, Floyd East Jr., in the head at the police station while being questioned about drugs that were found in his dorm room. University officials say that Daniels did not steal an officer's gun as originally reported. So let's go back to our top story. Pres the president says that it's time to get the wheels in motion, talking tax reform alongside hundreds of truckers in the heart of Pennsylvania. Nothing gets done in America without the hardworking men and women of the trucking industry. That is why my administration has taken historic steps to remove the barriers that have slowed you down. America first means putting American truckers first. America first. Our next guest was there and says that this is the message he and other business owners have been waiting to hear. Doug Henry is president and CEO of Henry Molded Products and he joins us now live. Good morning to you. Thank you so much for joining us. Good. Good morning to you. Thanks for having me. Well, so you were there at the rally last night in person. Uh, give us your impression. And I uh, understand I got a little tip that you were smiling when you heard what President Trump had to say just there. Well, he, he hit a lot of wide ranging topics, but he particularly focused on maintaining the robust uh, inertia that the economy has been enjoying, not only in the stock market, low unemployment, GDP growth in the last quarter, but also focusing on what our favorite subject is, the upcoming uh, reform of the tax code, and with particular emphasis on the benefits, not only for the general population and the middle class, but the independent and small business community. So how specifically will that help you and your company, your small business, your um, employees? How will it benefit them? Well, we're a great case study for the wide ranging impact. As a private company, Having lower taxes, increased margins, enable us to reinvest in the company. And I can tell you that many of our colleagues are just simmering, waiting to take advantage of this economy and grow their companies. In our case, we're capital intensive, so it takes a lot of money to buy the machinery and equipment to improve productivity, hire more people, 
create more goods and services. In our case, we're a packaging company mm -hmm. and we serve our friends in the large public and global company communities. So I understand the president said that, you know, more that as a result of this plan, more than 30 million Americans who have small businesses like you will uh, have a 40 percent cut in their marginal tax rate. So obviously that uh, trickles down and benefits people within your company. Well, that was the president's announcement, and it's in alignment with some of the numbers that we've heard in the past. But we are still holding fast to the fact that we really want to have tax parity with our large public and global corporation friends who we serve, not only as vendors, but don't forget, we are the innovators, the job creators, and our employment base represents well over half mm -hmm. of the total employment in the country. What's your impression of President Trump? You know, you were there listening last night along with hundreds of other people. Um, how many people do you think were present, and, or were present to listen to him? And do you believe what he's saying? Well, he was certainly speaking to an audience of supporters last evening and yesterday afternoon, but I think we share with the general population the opportunities and the optimism that can come out of these initiatives. He certainly seems to be focused on them because he brought our colleagues and the leadership, uh, uh, Secretary Mnuchin and uh, Gary Cohn, who's mm -hmm. chairman of the Economic uh, Council of Advisors, and that means he brought all the horsepower with him that's going to be focused on this tax reform and maintaining our economic uh, inertia. Yeah, so, so that's got to make you feel pretty good when, when all those people that can actually make the changes are there talking to you and telling you what they're going to do. Um, Doug, thank you so much for joining us. We, of course, wish you continued success with your company and appreciate you coming on. Thanks so much. I thank enjoyed you. being with you. All right, have a great day. Well, the time now is about 19 minutes after the top of the hour, and the vacation is over. Why former President Obama is heading back to the campaign trail, and when it comes to the national anthem, uh, these are the images that we are used to seeing, but take a look at this. At this football game, they stood, they sang, the story will make your day. Welcome back. Have you heard about this? A Christian group at Oxford University excluded from a campus event, event and you won't believe why. Carly Shipkiss with Fox News Headlines 24-7 Series XM 115 here to explain. So we've got a couple things that we're talking about, but we're going to begin here yes. with Oxford. Okay. Well, this one is causing international outrage, so it's a good place to start. So a Christian group was banned from attending this event for college freshmen at Oxford University. Mm -hmm. Now, the event organizer said that the Christian Union uh, was going to be banned because they would possibly make students feel unwelcome and marginalized. I think we have an email statement from that student who says, we recognize the wonderful advantages of having Christian Union representatives at the freshers or freshman fair, but are concerned that there is potential for harm to freshers who are already struggling to feel welcome at Oxford. Hmm. So this happened, by the way, at Balliol College at Oxford, which was founded by a bishop. So uh, my have times changed. And mm -hmm. I got to say, this not sitting well with a lot of people affiliated with the college and people across the country there. Let's take a look at some reaction. Uh, Peggy says, so the answer is to alienate the Christian group, typical liberal establishment. Martin says, a disgrace. Why are the elite so keen to disregard Christian beliefs, which have been the backbone of this country's culture for years? And Maurice says, pathetic, embarrassed as alumni that Oxford students need protecting from ideas uh, they might not agree with. Well, guess what? You know, those students spoke out mm -hmm. and they they, uh, you know, overturned the ban, and what ended up happening is they had a, a, a multi-faith stall or station at this fair. So where several of the different from, groups uh, can yeah, come together. Because exactly. I was going to ask, were any other groups banned, or was were they just targeted? It was, it was specifically a target on oh. the Christian faith. Yeah. Uh, he said this uh, this college this uh, student said that he didn't want any religions represented, and then they wound up having a bunch of religions represented right. at the yeah. end of the day. All right, so so let's talk about the Las Vegas shooting back on October first. 
obviously a lot of first responders, police, and uh, they've all been working overtime uh, trying to investigate, figure out what happened, and they're going to get a little bit of assistance yeah, from the federal the, government. The president made a very, very impressive announcement yesterday on Twitter. He says, happy to announce we are awarding $1 million to Las Vegas in order to help local law enforcement working overtime to respond to last Sunday's tragedy. So the announcement going over very well with the president's supporters. Rustin says this man is a saint. Rick says you're such a great president and I am proud of you. Make America great again, baby. Mm -hmm. And another tweet from Jacob says America is unbelievably grateful to have a president who is pro-law enforcement. Mm -hmm. so, and he's made that clear from the very beginning. Absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, like you said, police have been working overtime, so mm -hmm. this money is going to go a long way. Yeah. One million dollars. And all those victims, you know, that, that met the president and the first lady when he went out there to visit them, they said they were very impressed you yeah. know, with the president yeah. and, and yeah. how personable he was. Mm -hmm. So finally, uh, college football players, we've talked a lot about the kneeling that's been happening, but this is the complete opposite. You're going to like this story for sure. Yeah, absolutely. So this was a patriotic display. This happened in Hartford, Connecticut. The PA system failed, mm -hmm. so no national anthem could have been played over the loudspeakers. So uh, the teams and the crowd, they all rose up and sang the national anthem together. Take a listen. Beck on Twitter says, hopefully these boys will be the new men of the NFL someday. Yeah. Isn't that great? Actually, yeah. What does that hashtag stand for that? Is that what the hashtag yeah, was Yes, there? exactly. Stand yeah. for the anthem. Love it. Hashtag. Love it. Thank you so much, Carly. Thank Appreciate you so it. much. That's some good voices, too. <laughs> <laughs> well, the time now is about 27 minutes after the top of the hour. And NBC News buried the Harvey Weinstein story. But when it comes to President Trump... I feel like I've seen in the past year, two years, uh, around here in Washington, if it's an anti-Trump story, there's no vetting required. They'll just run with it. Seems like that, certainly. President Trump weighing in on that in a Fox News exclusive. Plus, it is the big debate this morning. Should girls be allowed to join the Boy Scouts? Jackie is live for us, and she's going to tell us what everyone is saying. Hey, Jackie. We're getting a lot of response responses this morning. It's now 4.30. People saying Boy Scouts should be Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts should be Girl Scouts. Don't go anywhere. We're going to be following this issue all morning long. And welcome back to Fox and Friends. First, the top story for you right now. President Trump set to take a major step in fulfilling another campaign promise after making his tax plan pitch to the American people. And Griff Jenkins joins us now live from Washington, D.C. Uh, Griff, the president says that his plan puts more money in the pockets of working families and it's fairer to the middle class. But how exactly does it work? Do you know? Hey, good morning, Heather. Yeah, it simplifies the tax code. That's important. Remember that. This plan reduces the existing eight brackets, if you include a zero bracket, as he does, down to a simple four. Here's what the president said last night. Under our framework, we make the zero bracket bigger and get rid of the 10% bracket, and we're reducing the 15% rate down to 12%. So you get four new brackets. It would be zero, 12%, 25%, and 35%. That's, you're going to hear a lot more about that. And the, the real key is the expansion of, as he said, that 0% bracket to include many who would have traditionally fallen into higher brackets. And, of course, the plan, as it's been mentioned before, doubles the standard deduction for individuals and families and cuts that corporate rate from 35% to 20%. Mm -hmm. So obviously mixed reactions, a different reaction from Democrats than we're getting from Republicans. What's that? Well, Democrats panned it, perhaps not a surprise. They called it a tax cut for the wealthy. House Minority Leader Nancy Pelosi hammered away on it, calling for bipartisanship, although she pretty much just wanted to say that it gives, uh, she didn't want to give one penny to the wealthy 1%. But the key, of course, is getting Republicans on board. And a little later this morning, uh, Speaker Paul Ryan will make a speech at Heritage Foundation saying, this is our moment to take control of things. We have to choose to do this. Heather? Well, I know the White House is saying the typical American household could see wages go up $4,000, um, but they've yet to really prove that, so that remains to be seen. Uh, thank you so much, Griff. Appreciate it. Thank you. Well, uh -huh. President Trump, meantime, is hoping for that Democratic support that Griff was just talking about of his tax plan with the goal of getting it passed by the end of the year. In an exclusive interview with our Sean Hannity, he explains that one of the biggest selling points will be, as we just said, in people's wallets. 
We have a zero bracket because a lot of people pay zero. So we really have four, and they had eight. So it's really eight down to four. We're cutting it in half. And a lot of a lot are taxed below the twelve thousand dollar mark and twenty four thousand dollar mark for family. They're taxed at zero. After that, it goes to twelve percent from fifteen percent. And you know, the Democrats told a very terrible fib. They said that they read the brackets so that the brackets were inverted. And if you read it that way, but that's not the way it goes. And we've been praised for the amount of money, the middle class. This is really what I'm looking for. For the middle class, I call it the working people. And the working people are going to get a massive tax break. And corporations and companies and small companies are going to get large scale tax relief. And they'll be able to keep compete with anybody in the world, you which see. is what we need. You know, a total of 4,000 over the next eight years for a family, that adds up. But President Trump's corporate tax rate, or cut, from 35% to 20% would make American firms more competitive as well. Big difference, because it works. Well, now to a Fox News alert for you. North Korea are ramping up tensions with the U.S., now claiming that war is on the way. Kitty Logan live for us in London with the very latest, these threats that just continue from the rogue nation. Good morning, Kitty. What's the latest? Good morning. Yes, well, that heated rhetoric between the U.S. and North Korea is continuing. And this time, it's the North Korean foreign minister who's been speaking out. Now, according to a Russian news agency, Ri Yong-ho has accused President Trump of, quote, lighting the fuse for war. He also talked of settling scores in, quote, a hail of fire. Now, he says these comments are in response to the president's speech at the U.N. last month in which he threatened to destroy North Korea. Now, of course, tension with North Korea have been increasing following a series of missile tests this year, including that sixth nuclear test. And there are fears, of course, as well, that Pyongyang may be developing a missile capable of reaching the U.S. President Trump says this current situation cannot continue. What was we the calm before can't the storm? let this to go on. We just can't. Now, you can say what you want. This should have been handled 25 years ago. It should have been handled 20 years ago and 10 years ago and five years ago. It should have been handled by numerous, not just Obama, but certainly President Obama should have taken care of it. Now, the U.S. and the U.N. have imposed stiff sanctions on North Korea, but this has not deterred Pyongyang from continuing weapons tests. And North Korea's foreign minister says that the country's nuclear program is not up for discussion. He claims these weapons are necessary as a deterrent. Heather. All right. Kitty Logan live for us again this morning. Thank you, Kitty. I appreciate it. Well, let's talk about this now. Back at home, an illegal immigrant accused of beheading his mother may not serve any time behind bars. A federal judge is reportedly expected to drop Oliver Mauricio Funes Machado's first degree murder charges, calling him, quote, not mentally competent to stand trial. What that means is instead he would be sent to a mental hospital. And back in March, the 18 year old, originally from Honduras, allegedly told police that he killed his mother at their North Carolina home because he, quote, felt like it. Well, one day after the Supreme Court drops one travel ban challenge, another one already on the way, a Washington State Attorney General Bob Ferguson has asked a federal judge to allow his case to move forward against the third version of the Trump administration's travel ban. The newest executive order restricting travel from eight countries is set to begin on October 18th, pretty soon. And former President Obama is back, sort of. He is coming out of retirement to hit the campaign trail for the first time since leaving the White House. Uh, Obama hoping to help Lieutenant Governor Ralph Northam pick up steam in Virginia's governor race. He is set to appear at a rally in the state next Thursday, focused on creating more economic opportunity for Virginians. Some people say he hasn't gone away, actually. Well, President Trump, meantime, is taking aim at, quote, fake news after NBC ran a story claiming that he surprised his national security advisors, calling for a major expansion of the U.S. nuclear arsenal. On Twitter, he called that report, quote, pure fiction. And then he tweeted, quote, network news has become so partisan, distorted and fake that licenses must be challenged and, if appropriate, revoked, not fair to public. And he then spoke to our very own Sean Hannity about the issue. Listen. Media is bad. They're really dishonest people. These are very, very dishonest people in many cases, in many cases. If I was just watching television, you don't know whether or not, because, you know, you're just watching a report. But when you're the one being written about, you know if it's good or bad, and it's always they try and make it negative. Well, opinion editor for The Washington Times, Charles Hurt, says that the media has no standards when it comes to stories specifically about President Trump. 
what we see from the, the uh, from places like NBC, other places, these stories that are completely refuted by all kinds of people inside the administration, people that have impeccable uh, reputations, completely refuted, and they just go with it because it's an anti-Trump thing. And, and, and it seems like, I've, I feel like I've seen in the past year, two years, uh, around here in Washington, if it's an anti-Trump story, there's no vetting required. They'll just run with it. It's got to be aggravating. You read it, you know it's not true, it's about you, but you can't do anything about it. And the time now for you is about 20 minutes until the top of the hour. They're one of the most lethal terror groups on the planet. And now Hezbollah has its sights set on U.S. shores. This is really scary stuff. Our next guest is a national security expert. And he says that, the, or she says, the Iran nuclear deal made that threat so much worse. Well, they are one of the most lethal terror groups on the planet. They are responsible for the deaths of hundreds of U.S. soldiers overseas. But now, U.S. officials say that Hezbollah now has its sights set on the U.S. homeland. Joining me now to weigh in on this is Hudson Institute fellow and national security expert Rebecca Heinrichs. But Rebecca, we always enjoy it when you're here with us to give us some insight. Thank you. Good morning, Heather. So let's first talk about, uh, before we get to the Iran deal, which I know is very important in this and how they influence Hezbollah or benefit them specifically, why they believe that they are setting their sights on the U.S. homeland. And I know that the State Department, specifically they talked about two arrests that had been made um, with Hezbollah connections in, in New York and in Michigan specifically. And they've also offered this $12 million reward for two others that they're currently looking for. What do we know about these, these these cases. Yeah, well, of course, um, Hezbollah is a Lebanese uh, terrorist organization. So normally when we think of Hezbollah, we think of Lebanon. Yeah. Um, but now we have an Obama or a, a Trump administration official who's now saying that, of course, they're, they've got this arm of Hezbollah that is looking at terrorism abroad. And that includes the United States. Obviously, this is an anti-Israel terrorist organization um, and uh, very active, gets all of its support from Iran. There's evidence, of course, you, you mentioned the two individuals that were, um, we believe, that were, were, were agents of Lebanon here in the United United States. Um, and so it's very concerning because this is a very well equipped terrorist group. Um, again, it used to be just contained to the, Lesbo, uh, uh, to the Lebanon region. And now, we're, of course, we're seeing that, um, that Americans at home are, are in danger as well. Yeah. And I know that the two individuals that were taken into custody, one an explosive expert and then another what they call a sleeper. Uh, talk to us about the Iran deal, though, because people don't know or make the connection there and why they benefit Hezbollah. Right. Well, many um, individuals who complained about the Iran deal, myself included, was that um, it, it, it was focused narrowly on constraining uh, just the nuclear part of the Iranian problem. But of course, Iran is still a state sponsor of terrorism. It still sponsors um, all these terrorist groups that, that, that cause all this upheaval across the Middle East um, and abroad. And so uh, whenever you give Iran access to all of this billions of dollars, you're funding their terrorism operations. And so mm -hmm. when President um, when President Trump Trump looks at the Iran deal um, in the next couple of days and has to announce whether he's going to certify it, its compliance or decertify its compliance, um, he's going to look at its support for terrorism. Yeah. Um, because all of these billions of dollars cannot, you know, we can't give it all these billions of dollars and our allies give it all these billions of dollars just for Iran to turn around and support groups like Hezbollah, which endanger Americans. So people hear that, and, and we know that even the Obama administration admitted that this happens, that, that Iran benefits terrorist groups. So why was it signed to begin with in the way that it was and, and do you think that President Trump does need to decertify it? Right. The idea um, from many Obama officials was that if you legitimize the Iranian regime, if you bring them into the international community, if you treat them like a responsible power, then eventually they will moderate and the Iranians will become a responsible power. That's not the way it works. It's not the way people work. The Iranians were never a repentant power. They were never sorry for their support for terrorism. Um, but that was the idea. It was a naive idea. idea. Um, of course, it's not planning out. I do believe that President Trump should decertify the deal. Um, and then President, you know, there's, there's two ways that President Trump can come out winning for the United States, and that is actually negotiate a better deal with the Iranians, close these loopholes, mm -hmm. um, you know, hammer down on their support for terrorism, their missile program. And the other way he can, he can win for the United States is to walk away from a bad deal. That's something President Obama was not willing to do. And right. when you negotiate, the power that's willing to walk away is the power that actually has more leverage and, and can get a better deal, and that well should be said. the United States. Yeah, well said. It was a campaign promise that he said he would keep, so we'll see what happens this time. Thank you so much, Rebecca Heinrichs, joining us early this morning. You have to come back, promise.
Thanks. Thank Thanks, you. Heather. Well, let's take you back to this story we've been following. An urgent race to escape relentless wildfires in California. At this hour, authorities are going door to door. They're telling people to get out before it's too late. For many, it is already too late. Let's get right to Will Carr. He's live for us from Coffee County or Coffee Park. That's in Santa Rosa, where everything has burned to the ground. Good morning, Will. That's right, Heather. This is a wasteland. When you look around, property after property has been destroyed out here. You can see the car behind me looks like it's gone through Armageddon. And this is what we're seeing as, as we're driving street by street here. Now, as of this morning, 23 people have died. This could end up being the deadliest wildfire in California's history. The previous record was 29 deaths back in 1933, but there are still hundreds of people who are missing across this area. In fact, listen to one woman who says she was talking to her elderly mother on the phone as the flames were racing towards her mom's house. Take a listen. I hear the smoke alarms going off and she's coughing, coughing, and I'm telling her I love her and she, she tells me she's going to die. She can't get out of her house. She's going to die. And then the phone call drops and I can't get her back on the phone. Certainly terrifying situations for so many here. Thousands still evacuated, Heather, and it's another red flag warning day. So more fires could potentially be on the way. Heather. Yeah, I know a lot of elderly people there. They just could not get out in time. Uh, Will, thank you so much for joining us. Appreciate it. Just horrible. You bet. Well, the time now is about 10 minutes until the top of the hour. And President Trump, he has a personal message for Colin Kaepernick. You cannot disrespect our country, our flag, our anthem. You cannot do that. The president's new advice for the NFL is up next.